today saw it happen and how Buddhism, Confucianism, and Christianity in Chosen Korea. Um, I will start with some very general facts which probably are known to all of you. And then going on will sometimes, maybe in, in due time, uh, go to more controversial things uh, to end with the most controversial statements at the very end. We'll build up to a kind of climax. Um, There is a something which you all have encountered, I'm sure. There's a popular uh, assumption, a stereotype, which is not entirely untrue, like most stereotypes, but not completely true, that when the Joseon dynasty started in at the end of the, uh, the 14th century, uh, the Confucianization of Korea started, and that Buddhism was pushed down in society, and that um, it could only survive uh, thanks to its popularity among the common people. Uh, and Koreans uh, in this period became more Confucian even than the Chinese. And then there is, you certainly have come across Confucianism as a kind of explanation of the present state of Korea. And this is actually among academics at the moment very controversial because Confucianism by itself is a very vague concept. Uh, people mean very different things when they use the word Confucianism. And I hope that maybe also at the end of the lecture um, I have made it a little bit clearer what the meaning of Confucianism in this case might be as in uh, how Confucianism maybe still could serve as a um, explanation, but especially actually what I will stress even more is um, that uh, we have to be very careful using the term, and maybe in some ways uh, shouldn't use it. Um, the study of late Joseon Buddhism has been very much neglected, at least till about the year 2000. The last 10, 15 years, quite a lot of work, work has been done. Um, but, and this work, which has been done in recent years, uh, is that uh, showing us that the dominance of Confu Confucianism was not as strong as often thought. And uh, I also will talk about certain developments, especially in the 18th and 19th century, uh, which I think have been important, not just for the history of Confucianism, but also for the history of religions in general in Korea. So, and um, I think that only if we pay attention to these new developments and we'll be able to understand certain things that happened, for instance, in the 20th century. I start to go back now to the very beginning, actually, of Buddhism in Korea. Uh, most of you, I think, will be very familiar with the story of how Buddhism and Confucianism entered Korea about the same time, and where it was often the same people who brought these two. Uh, for instance, in the early years, but often Buddhist monks who also pro propagated what we now would consider to be Confucian values. But that ends when, uh, at the end of the audio period actually already, ready, uh, when the Neo-Confucians um, have hegemonic claims and uh, have a, an often a kind of uh, see Buddhism rather as a kind of enemy, a competitor. And um, so this time uh, there is uh, real <coughs> oppression uh, of the Buddhism to a certain extent after the 1392. Um, and Buddhism certainly survived, but one thing you can say, and that I agree with, uh, that it was relegated to the bright private sphere, but as I hope to show you, uh, not the private sphere only of common people, but also of the uh, elite and the royal family, the young bang, the aristocracy, and actually in all layers of the population. And a part of what I'm going to, a uh, big part of what I'm going to tell you tonight is how did Buddhism survive in what forms and to what extent. First, 
then kind of list of examples uh, on the left side, side uh, the oppression of Buddhism, which in some ways was very real. Uh, for instance, a lot of temple property was expropriated. The number of sects was uh, reduced uh, to two, uh, the meditation and the study of uh, sutras, basically. Um, and Buddhist rituals were gradually uh, excluded from the official state rituals. Um, for instance, um, uh, in the times of um, epidemics, originally in the Korea period, uh, there was often a Buddhist ritual to get rid of the epidemic. That kind of thing did not survive in the chosen period. There were also quite a few Confucian scholars who uh, engaged in anti-Buddhist polemics and um, the social status of monks became lower and certainly of the common monks. So that's on the negative side, but then on the right hand uh, we start to see uh, the positive things. There was some continue to be an intense involvement certainly of the early kings of Buddhism. Um, there's some examples, uh, King Sejong uh, composed a song about the life of the Buddha, uh, the warning Chongyang Chongyang Chigok, the song of the moon reflected on a thousand rivers. Um, there was also a prose version made of it. And the prose version and the poetic version were combined in the work of the Warin Sokpo. And then the son of um, Sejong, King Sejo, had sutras translated into Korean. And he also collaborated on this prose biography of the Buddha I just mentioned. He, King Sejo, actually is a quite exam exceptional because uh, he really was maybe primarily a Buddhist, although maybe not in his actions, because he was the one who uh, killed his own nephew, uh, the, uh, who had become king, to become king himself. Uh, this is a picture which you find in some Korean temples uh, uh, on the outside. Uh, uh, actually, this is King Sejo. There's a story about him. And, um, uh, he was suffering from a kind of skin disease which gave him great discomfort. And uh, once when he was um, at Odesan, um, he was suffering from that so much that he, uh, uh, when he saw a little brook, he thought, well, I'll, I'll just bathe and maybe uh, get rid of the worst itching. While he was doing this, a young monk appeared and said, I'll help you. I'll wash your back. And, that's what we see in the picture. Then, uh, when this had happened, the king was grateful, and he said to the young monk, you shouldn't tell anyone. And then the, young, the monk said, actually, you shouldn't tell anyone. I am Manjushri. And Manjushri is one of the Buddha, the Bodhisattvas of wisdom, uh, who appears here in the guise of a monk. And uh, Odesan uh, was famed as a place where you could see the vision of Manjushri. So anyway, it shows that uh, the King Soet Sejo had this involvement with Buddhism. One thing that happened was that Buddhism learned quite quickly, actually, to adapt their uh, defense of uh, Buddhism in Confucian terms. Um, so there is a monk called Kiha, uh, they, they usually have long, complicated names. And he justified Buddhism by referring to a, a Confucian classics, the great learning, the Tashwe, and the in Korean. He said this, I perceive that the directors of the Tripitaka, the Buddhist canon, are intended to do nothing more than to prompt people to abandon passions and to realize their natures. If we teach people to cultivate themselves while relying on this, on this doctrine, then their minds can be rectified, their persons cultivated, their families regulated, the nation ordered, and all their heaven, peace. Everything that is in, in, uh, in red is um, from the Tashwe. Please, please tell me if, I, if it's not clear enough, then I should hold the mic closer to my mouth, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, so then, uh, 
during the um, Tolson period, you have to, um, several monks who are important for the status of Buddhism, but also interesting uh, when you want to know how the relationship between Buddhism and Confucianism was. For instance, Hu Zhong Shaosan Tessa was maybe the most famous uh, among some people as the leader of the monks' armies against the Japanese invaders at the end of the 16th century. Um, he wrote a book in which he argued that uh, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism all actually uh, propagate the same reality. But in the end, he said Buddhism is the highest form of these teachings, but uh, basically they're the same. And there's a much less well-known monk called Chimbeng, Zen or Song Master, and his, his um, name, Chimbeng, is taken from the analects. Um, uh, Qin uh, is a pillow, and Quang is to use uh, is to, yeah, and is to use your arm as a, a pillow. Uh, so he wrote the following poem, in which uh, I'll first read, read it: in the eating of coarse rice and the drinking of water, the using of one's elbow for a pillow. Uh, that's Qin Meng. Joy is to be found. Wealth and rank to me are passing clouds, as passing clouds. Aspiring to the golden days of Amitabha, I listen to the wind in the branches. Everything in this poem, uh, until aspiring to the golden days, is from the Nun Yu, that the saints, the Analecta of Confucius. So he, in some way, he, he makes Confucius into a kind of helper of Buddhism, not only in the and there's this twist which make the context of all Buddhist. Then, well, uh, about a century after that, there's a monk called Yondam Yui, who writes also an apology for Buddhism against Confucian objections. And he says that if you only practice Confucian prayer virtues, you're a good son, a filial son, for instance, or a loyal subject to the king, then you'll get go straight to the paradise of the pure land of Amitabha, as the Buddha who rules and preaches in this pure land. And in one of his letters he wrote to a Confucian gentleman, he said, it's not just the practice of Buddhism that leads to one to paradise. And it's quite revolutionary, actually. In a way, he said, you don't have to go uh, to be a, a Buddhist to go to the pure, pure land. You will go there anyway if you're a good Confucian. Same, you, could, you, you might think this was a kind of extraordinary uh, thought of an unusual monk, but um, it's not like that because there were many Buddhist kasa songs in the Chosen period, and in one of these songs, uh, you can find very similar uh, ideas. And did you do your utmost and loyal service to king and country? This is a question asked by the judges of the other world. But they judge whether you, how you will be reborn after death. So were you filial to your parents and did you uphold family custom? So here to the it seems that it becomes clear that actually um, being a good Confucian or following Confucian virtues is essential also to reaching the pure land of Amitabha. Um, now, we may ask, of course, whether this filial piety was completely um, extraneous, actually, to Buddhism originally, or whether it was something which you could also find in Buddhism quite early. And the case can be made that it was present in Buddhism already from the, from the origin. But what is certain is that in China, where filial piety, of course, also was a great virtue, it was emphasized. Uh, you see the influence of this uh, so today. Uh, I took this picture at the uh, 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 the san here, quite uh, next door almost, and uh, it was one a series of panels, uh, which uh, you could see there about two years ago, uh, with uh, passages from a sutra, actually a sutra made in China, um, as well not really the words of the Buddha, but um, apocryphal sutra, 
uh, which uh, argues uh, that um, the debt you have towards your parents is so big that you can never completely uh, pay, repay your parents for it. So, and then, so the panels show how, how the mother in all kinds of ways takes care of the little child. Um, parents, as you, and if you don't know, uh, never cease to regard their own children uh, as children. And so even if the child uh, is very old herself and bent already, the mother is still just can take care, take care of you know, uh, that you don't fall into the street in here. Uh, Buddhists also in the Chosen period uh, uh, had a chance in a way to show that there were arrogance and loyalty when the Japanese invaded. It was not the first time in Korean history that monks actually took up weapons to defend the country, but in the, uh, the Indian invasion of the Japanese they did it quite successfully. And there were actually almost immediately the leaders of the monster armies who were honored by the government shrines which are called the Pyo Chung Sa, but then they use a different character from Sa. And that there's in Miriam, uh, there's a temple which uh, has taken up this uh, cult of the monks as defenders of the of the fatherland. So one of these monks, uh, I think I many of you have heard, have heard of him, was the Sam Yong Dan. Uh, uh, Dong, uh, so I guess I actually he was too old to go uh, fighting himself, but Sam and then really went into the field to lead the monks armies. And, uh, at the entrance of uh, Gongbuk University, you have the statue. Uh, at the bottom of the statue, uh, there is the, the scene of the monks actually fighting. Now, uh, if you think of the relations between Confucianism and, also, uh, and Buddhism and shamanism, you see that there's this kind of overlapping within society between the way of thinking and some rituals. In Buddhism, you have the so-called Kamdo Tengha. Uh, we'll see some examples afterwards. And the street dual nectar paintings. And these paintings were related to ritual, which was especially for people who had died uh, before their time, in a, a natural way, because of illness, because they have been eaten by a tiger or drowned or something like that. Exactly the same kind of um, uh, people are worshipped, also by Confucians. Uh, it's maybe not completely correct to call it a Confucian ritual, but it was a ritual which was performed by Confucians by, by the government the uh, command of the, of the king in many cases was called Yaje and this was performed from about 1400 till the beginning of the 20th century. It's not very well known nowadays, so uh, it completely disappeared. But, uh, so Confucians had something like that for the same class of people and Shamans also had it for what was often called young son spirits, also people who had died before that time in modern shamanic songs for instance uh, among the young sound spirits, you have people who are being killed in war, uh, crushed by tank fits and so on, uh, uh, machine guns and so on. So it's updated a bit, but uh, the idea is the same. Uh, people uh, who have died in a, a natural way before they uh, were uh, reaching the right old age, they uh, needed a kind of um, specification, otherwise they might pose a danger. And there was a, there was a kind of universal idea. Yeah, here you have one of these pictures. Huh? Um, so here's the ritual itself. These are hungry ghosts. And this is an example of the uh, restless spirits. Here, for instance, you have a guy who obviously is about to be devoured by a tiger. Uh, and, uh, in many of these paintings, you have at the bottom, you have the scenes from daily life. Um, the, the deceased were also important for everyone, actually. Uh, so, um, 
certainly for Confucians, huh? uh, the ancestors were important, but they're also for Buddhists and Shamanists, and also the Josan, the ancestors are of great importance. What we see here is a print made in the 19th, middle of the 19th century. Uh, um, And you would read this, and you can see this, the, uh, the name of the, the woman who had actually commissioned to make the making of this print, and for whom she did it for her deceased husband and, and several other relatives. It's a print actually <laughs> made in Poland, so I had this type of form of coax nowadays, but uh, in the past, outside, so prepared to find any people from so And also prayers for the uh, birth of children, where I find this field uh, where Confucians and Buddhists uh, could uh, do the same things because uh, not to have children to uh, have people to perform the ancestral uh, rituals that was uh, uh, example was considered to be an example of lack of filial piety and uh, so it's also a part of Confucian, uh, Confucians and you see that um, also kings like King Chongzhou at the end of the 18th century, century recognized Buddhist contribution in this respect and here you see uh, the Bodhisattva Abhirukitesha uh, Kwanda Kosparsela who bestows a child on uh, this couple who are devoutly praying for one. Now it's clear also when you look at many temples and when you look at the history of many temples uh, that are still around uh, that uh, these temples could not have been built and the, the paintings in temples could not have been painted without powerful and rich patrons. And when you see a picture like this, it's uh, absolutely obvious that it's not just the, the, the poorest in society, the illiterate peasants who uh, patronized Buddhism at that time. There were certainly still prominent and wealthy patrons also in the 17th and 18th and 19th century. Uh, this is confirmed when you look at the book production in this period. So there are many books, uh, sometimes with illustrations. And, um, these books were obviously made also for people who were able to read the Chinese text of most of these books. Uh, when you look carefully at these books, also in the margin, you find names of people who are paid for printing that page. So uh, that's also a very good way to find out what kind of people uh, were um, patronizing Buddhism around this time. Now, uh, this is the royal family. I already mentioned that the royal family went on to patronize Buddhism. And uh, it was noted by Charles Allen Clark, uh, who wrote the first substantial history of Korean religions. And he said it's interesting to note that even now, wherever you find a tomb, and you need a tomb for uh, the kings of members of the royal family, you are pretty sure to find a temple just over the hill. And that is still actually when the hill uh, you can verify this uh, uh, near royal tombs, out of sight usually, but nearby, you always have what they call a one tower or a bond like a prayer temple for um, the uh, life of the hereafter of the deceased. The interesting thing is that in the 18th century some, some kings have tried to uh, prevent people building these bond but they did it themselves all the same. Uh, the, uh, for instance, King Yongjo was one of these kings uh, and he um, made the temple of Yom Hazade, the, the Menchim Monsao had a great prayer temple for his predecessor, John Gong, John consort. 
and Ching Wangsa, Ching Wangsa, one of the temple's heroes, uh, near Seoul, uh, was the one that was his mother at Hong Kong Sa, and near Yonsei University, that uh, was the one that for his grandchild. And then, uh, nowadays, uh, I hope some of you have seen this film, Sado, which is about Zhong Hyo's father, and uh, was killed by uh, Yong Hyo, uh, probably because he was uh, insane and difficult to maintain at uh, the court. Uh, whatever the reason, uh, King Chong Jo was born for about 10 years when this happened. He, uh, after he came to power himself, he decided to honor his uh, father uh, by moving his grave to here, so on. Uh, but also building a temple there, Yong Ju San, and so it's also a long time for his father. And he also had the, uh, the, the sutra about filial piety, the Pumo and Dung Yong reprinted. Also, here in Seoul, you can, uh, there's a temple called the Han Chong San in Song Bukdong. It's now, it used to be outside the city, yeah, but it's now almost completely surrounded by high-rise apartments. Um, and in the temple, you see this uh, calligraphy. Maybe you say it's not real calligraphy, but it's written by a five-year-old. So and there's a, a, a uh, figure called Yong Ching Wang. He never made it to become a king, but he uh, was. The royal son. Uh, there's a very long connection also between this temple, which really goes back to the beginning of the Chosen period and uh, right to the end. So uh, you see this constant patronage from uh, the uh, royal family for Buddhism. So in the Chosen period, uh, uh, on the one hand, it's true that there were no, at the end, or after a certain moment, no longer any temples inside the city walls. Uh, so uh, the city will have been purged, you might say, uh, from all kinds of Buddhist influences. Um, but immediately outside the city, uh, there were scores and scores of temples. And people from the city have to go there constantly. Sometimes these temples were uh, very close, actually. There is still one called Chizang Ham, maybe, or Chizang Sai Ham. It's actually the matter, it's about here, uh, just outside the city wall. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, also you see in descriptions of customs in, for instance, the 18th century uh, uh, of what happened in Seoul that on the Buddha's birthday, everyone would hang out lanterns. And so people were in the sense of Buddhism, Buddhist, that they uh, did not have their temples right within the city walls because uh, uh, what was inside the city wall had been made into a kind of Confucian sacred city. So I think many of you will also know this place. Uh, it's very nicely located, although there's and the highway in front of it actually is these days, but um, so this is also a connection with the royal family if you go to the temple and you see that there is a kind of legend of um, the, the, help, the founder, for instance, of the Chosen Dynasty. Then uh, there were also some temples uh, near Seoul in Seoul at the beginning. Uh, for court ladies, for, for widows, for uh, court ladies who for some reason have not been married. And one of them is this temple that is uh, also now inside the city, but outside the city wall. Chong Yong Sa, the Sam Rak Sam, that is actually in the middle of the city, but these days. Uh, uh, that was the place where uh, I think. The widow of King Tanjong lived after uh, Tanjong had been sent to Yongwo, first in exile and 
where he was, uh, after a couple of years, was killed. The Chinese diaspora for maybe 60 years. And they say you know, that uh, every morning, evening, I think, uh, she would go up into, uh, on a hill nearby, which now is called the Bang Bang Bong, at the peak of uh, looking towards the east, because her husband was in Dong Wall, it was in Dong Wall, so to the east. And, uh, this temple was not just for this little, but it was also for other ladies from the court. Then, um, the interest of uh, intellectuals in, uh, for, uh, in Buddhism is also shown by this person, Kim Man Jung, uh, the author of the Kuhn Monk and the Cloud Ring of the Nine or the Nine Cloud Ring sometimes, uh, which shows that he had a great familiarity with uh, the teachings. The, of the teaching of the Diamond Sutra, which is that fundamentally we are already enlightened. We need only uh, we need a kind of journey, uh, and in the, the novel it's literal actually uh, to realize that we are enlightened. And so I did. Uh, if you, I'm sure that many of you have met the old monk. Remember, in the beginning, just the monk who was reborn as a young man. And he has a kind of uh, uh, journey in his life. And at the end of the, his life, he remembers what he has been in his past life. So in a way, he's back on the original point, but now he's enlightened. And then uh, in the Dharma Sutra, you have this quotation at the, at the bottom here, all this Dharma, illusion, the dream, the phantasm, double, shadow, as an essence as Jew, a transcend as lightning, and must be seen as such. And you also have this in the novel that is quoted, really. So Kim An Jung uh, was a Confucian, he was also someone at certain times uh, uh, held high office, but he was also a Buddhist, you might say. And this person, Yu uh, 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 he is usually known as a Shiva. A pragmatic school scholar. Um, he's also famous because at a certain moment he had an interest in Catholicism. Uh, some people say actually that he remained a kind of crypto Catholic until the end of his life. But um, I look at it a little bit different way because I think there is no um, exclusive choice to be made in, this case, in, in these cases in Joseph Peter, certainly. Uh, he was undoubtedly a Confucian also. He wrote commentaries to Confucian works and so on. His interest in that was great and, and very serious. Um, he had this interest in Catholicism. Uh, and, uh, uh, I think um, there's dispute about whether he remained Catholic or not. But what is, uh, until recently, has not been highlighted very much in, in, in some ways. He also, during his entire life, Pepper had a deep interest in Buddhism, which really already started in his, uh, the, uh, when he was very, very young as a child. And then, uh, at a certain period of his life, when he's in court, uh, there's not much, not much sign of it, but when he goes into exile, it blossoms again. And uh, he abundantly shows it at that time. So these two attitudes and the differences that you see on the left is this, this official uh, pronouncement to Chong Zhou as from Mao Zedong that that's that been notorious since all the time for exploiting innocent people, losing thousands and trying to jump in implications. And this is against a certain form of Buddhism, you might say, but not against uh, Buddhism per se, I think. But privately, in the later years, he said that the pine leaf had on citrus soup made of pine leaves. I would rather delve into Buddha's teachings in my remaining years in the world rather than uh, looking at all kinds of confusing scriptures, for instance. And so, the first quotation also is this again, uh, stating in other words. 
and he exchanged lots of poems and letters with monks. Uh, and some of them have been recorded also in the, in the record of looking at the moon. And then he had famous friendships uh, also with the monk Choi, uh, uh, what is kind of Korean classical tea. Uh, and, uh, and he supported the monks also materially. And some things uh, related to Pomansa. Pomansa is also one of these temples which has this uh, enduring relationship with the uh, royal family. Uh, basically, I think if you see a temple which has either a uh, country or sometimes a king in the title, in its name, or in Pom, you, you can count on that there is some kind of uh, connection with the royal family. Um, and when you look carefully at the uh, left of Pomenza, this for instance, this monument, uh, which uh, commemorates the Devon Moon, uh, the father of King Kodro, who um, was a benefactor of the temple. And the son Kodro uh, had prayers said at the temple when his son was sick. And when he was healed, he said thanks to prayers of Tsubosa, which in Britain had been the one of his John, his first wife, an early king. He declared that the filial piety and Buddhist faith and origin are not to not to Hyoshi uh, Shinchi, one who believe. Also, uh, when you have been to um, Omansai, you may have seen this calligraphy. It's reputed to be the last calligraphy done by the famous calligrapher Tusa Kim Jong-hee, Jong uh, the very last thing when he was ill with that also. It's, uh, in a building which was made especially to house the, the wooden blocks of which the Sutra, the Patantaka Sutra was printed. And it's very interesting to see who contributed to the the printing of the Apatamsaka Sutra, uh, which was done by the priest of Namo Yongi. So it was supported by King Totong and his consort, by the Queen Dowager, by the wife of the students, King Chongso, the king who never really ruled, which uh, made the king of the students be, by the father in law of King Hondo, and maybe for me at least most interesting is uh, contributions and also with by four, four former headmasters of the Confucian Academy, the Songun Wang, and also by several other officials, and of course, also certainly in our public life, and there are Confucians. Very interesting person also is uh, this man, Zhou Yidong, who is mainly famous, uh, most famous maybe, uh, as a painter. And so the painting here is made by him. But he was also an intellectual who wrote a lot. Uh, his collected works also have been edited in a very kind of nice edition um, 10 years ago, I think. And um, he thought actually that Confucianism was best, but that there were lots of things uh, in Buddhism that were all interesting, he liked the style of Buddhist writings, for instance. And he also thought that the Buddhist teaching are not so different from those of Confucianism. And he had actually a very interesting idea also. In Buddhism, you have the idea of uh, upanya, skillful good means. That means that whatever uh, is helpful to you uh, is good, is acceptable. And um, he said that actually Buddhism is a kind of upanya for Confucianism. So people who are not capable of uh, understanding the principles of Confucianism completely, Buddhism will help. As I use the Buddhist concept of actually to uh, argue for the uh, uh, superiority of Confucianism. But he certainly also himself at certain moments uh, seemed almost like a Buddhist. So, was Confucianism uh, in the chosen period, in the Buddhism, oppressed? Uh, Generated religion, which is often 
that still can put especially in popular books, not so much more in this case in um, academic writing. Right? Um, you find counter evidence to this in many forms. I've given several examples already, but there is more. There are the laws very commemorating monks which have been written by Confucian scholars who had their names mentioned also, huh? so they were not ashamed of uh, commemorating the monks. Uh, Ibn Han, who wrote a big book uh, in the early 20th century about the history of Korean Buddhism, maybe that notes that in the 19th century, uh, some meditation was extremely popular among intellectuals. And in the same period, as so the second half of the Thompson, uh, period, about the 19th century, sorry, uh, there were all kinds of lay associations and so on, who published books in, in Hanun, as so well in, in Chinese, basically. And when you look at these books, you see that the preferences to these books are often written by Confucians, who start to say that maybe uh, Confucianism and Buddhism are different, but, and then follows a long story arguing exactly the opposite. So there were many interfaces at the time that were from the world of Buddhist Confucian contact and dialogue. So yeah. academically at least there is a kind of consensus I think at the moment uh, that this uh, Chosen Buddhism also in the second half of the Chosen period uh, was much more vital than it's often I think get credit for it. And if you, uh, know this and realize this, that we understand that there is, it was a stronger base for the regeneration of Buddhism in the 20th and 21st century. It was also easier to understand that uh, culturally, actually, Buddhism for many, for many people uh, remained important. Uh, you see, we have an interesting phenomenon in Korea at the moment that, um, for instance, a book by certain Buddhist writers, Bob Johnson, in the best example, are read by many, many people who actually are not Buddhist, but for instance, Catholics or something else, or nothing in the front, but they still read these books. So, um, how does that happen? It's easier to understand if you realize that it actually is uh, almost a natural thing. Uh, and, uh, that uh, in the Chosen period, Buddhism did not go completely underground, so to speak. These are some sort of pictures, especially the picture of Monastra, and it's, uh, it's a chosen, certainly a Confucian gentleman, but if you look very carefully, you see on the table there's a small Buddhist grocery in front of him. So, but I've been saying so now, uh, I think most scholars, and I think I agreed about that, but uh, now something which is a bit more controversial to be continued continue to regard to the might and loyalty as Confucian virtues. Uh, every time we find uh, these things, uh, should we still say that that's Confucianism? Uh, in my view, actually, maybe we should not. Uh, um, uh, as one argument, you could say that um, it doesn't make much sense, maybe nowadays, uh, to call Christianity a Middle Eastern religion. Uh, if you think of a Middle Eastern religion, we think of something quite different. Uh, so, of course, in origin, it's Middle Eastern, but uh, uh, it has cha changed in the meantime. And there's actually a shaman who gave me kind of insight into this problem at a certain moment, Pyongyang Harmony, and his Pyongyang grandmother. Uh, she came to London in uh, 1992 uh, to, for a conference, and actually I saw the conference was for sale here. <laughs> uh, but um, anyway, she, she was there, and she performed the 13th uh, ritual, in which one part uh, looked very much like Confucian Kesa. And the day after the ritual, uh, people could ask her questions. And um, one lady said, asked, um, 
what you did yesterday was a Confucian ritual. And I'm telling you how you are really, really puzzled. Was silent for about 40 seconds, I think. And then she said it was, it was Korean chaser. <laughs> Uh, I think that's exactly the right answer. Huh? These things have become so universal and that it doesn't make any sense uh, anymore to uh, call it Confucian. But it's not to say that Confucianism has not influenced modern Korean society. Huh? That's a different thing. Huh? But, uh, to say that at a certain moment these virtues were still Confucian, to me, doesn't make so much sense. If you look at Lei Chao Song, how we can look at it in different ways. And, uh, is there a kind of rise of Buddhism or a regeneration of Buddhism? Or is the decline and elimination of Confucianism? Uh, the, um, the rise of Buddhism certainly is there at no point. Uh, um, this is the this is public recognition of what I mentioned of the contribution of the Buddhist armies in the struggle against the Japanese. There is widespread financial support for the rebuilding of temples from all kinds of of society. The Buddhist Kasa, even natural songs are quite popular. Uh, the interesting thing about Kasa is that not many Kasa actually were printed in the Chosen period. Only of some very famous uh, poets like Song Ram, uh, Tong Cho, uh, in his collected works. He also has a few Kasa, but they were not widely distributed. But there are Buddhist Kansa were widely distributed in Buddhist literature of the 18th century, especially. And there was this elite interest in Buddhist meditation, which was also noted by uh, Inan Ma, was interest in the more philosophical scriptures of Buddhism. Uh, there was printing of Buddhist ritual manuals, also quite a bit of research has been done about that. And manuals in, in Hanmun, Chinese. And there was this printing, I just already mentioned actually that it is this text, a bilingual text to promote the veneration of the Buddha and Tantra, which also included Kasa. So here you have one of these virtual handbooks. This actually is quite a bit older, the 15th century. This is Yongbu Kogonmun, this is the 18th century text, which includes also Kasa, which has, you can see, it's bilingual, and Christie. Uh, Original Hamburg text and then the uh, translation. It's also clear. It's clear. Uh, so it was printed and reprinted throughout the 18th century, something like six, six times. Uh, bilingual, as I already said. And it promoted a kind of simple idea that the invocation of Amitabha, particularly at the moment that you are about to die would ensure actual rebirth in the pure land of Amitabha, even for the worst of sinners, irrespective of gender or social status. Uh, then there's something which is important for what I'm going to say afterwards. Rebirth in the pure land would put an end to the cycle of rebirth in lower forms of Christians <coughs> and ultimately to Buddhahood. Because if you are in this pure land, uh, all day long you can listen to the preaching of Amitabha and this prevents you falling back into a lower form of existence. So people often say that the, idea, the basic idea of Buddhism is the idea of uh, reincarnation. But actually when you're in the pure land there is no longer reincarnation. Maybe as a kind of higher, Buddha, uh, higher being, then you can become a Buddha, but uh, or an Arhat, a disciple of the Buddha. But, uh, into the lower form of existence. So you no longer you will no longer be reborn into, into an existence that really entails suffering. So now heaven and hell. Huh? Uh, so here you have a kind of concept of uh, heaven. Um, and um, on the left you see the depiction of that and uh, heaven is seen as a place where uh, you listen to the Buddha here, uh, seated on a lotus, uh, and around you are plants and uh, flowers and everything, and uh, also many beautiful birds, and a very pleasant place 
in contrast to Hell, uh, which you see here where it is sinners and cooked, and uh, the assistance of the churches of Hell who you see on here. Uh, I'll show you say how much time there is actually. Three minutes. Um, here you see also in a modern temple uh, the depiction of people who are taken to the pure land uh, in the dragon boat. Uh, um, uh, what is up to uh, And here another depiction of a uh, paradise, uh, a pure land. One more. Firstly, you see that it's rebirth in paradise, uh, uh, or the pure land. And these two here. So again, it's the um, Amitabha in the middle, the two bodhisattvas who are helpers. Uh, this one is Chijang, Chikigarva, who uh, has made a vow that he will take people out of hell. Moment, uh, you can be saved from hell by Chizam. How many of us the points of us also who guides people to the pure land? So, the, the persons who decide where you go huh, are the ten kings of the other world. And uh, actually, uh, Better made to purgatory than hell. The hell is easier. Um, heaven and hell also works better than hell and uh, heaven and purgatory. Uh, because you're basically, you can't stay maybe for very long periods of time in this purgatory, but um, it's not forever. I mean, there's still a moment, a uh, possibility that you may go back to another existence. Also, a depiction of what is is the freezing hell. Uh, some, some hells are too hot, some hells are too cold. They're all very, very unpleasant. <laughs> this is the punishment for slanderers. Uh, if you look carefully, you see that actually this is the tongue of the slanderer. Uh, it draws out a uh, uh, plow, the sharp plow share. And it goes on and on, uh, but, uh, even if you're completely taken apart by these guys. The next time uh, they will reconstitute you so that you don't suffer again. Here, yeah, this is also an older picture. This is actually a 16th century picture, but here you see many of the elements of the concept of heaven and hell in, in two pages of a book. Uh, here are people who obviously have been good, uh, are bound for a good place, uh, so that these people. Uh, but here, again, some sinners uh, are cooked. Uh, here, you see some forms of uh, reincarnation. That's very hungry. Born as an uh, animal, hungry, born as a kind of uh, titan-like figure or a human form. Here, you see one of the messengers of hell. This side this is what they call a karmic mirror. You see them in many tem temples, modern temples, uh, quite often. Um, so this will show what you have been doing, what bad deeds you have been doing in your life, like for instance, getting a cow or being between animals. Again, one of these three Jew paintings, so, um, this one emphasizes the ways dying for in battle here. People are actually fighting uh, with more or less more on a weaponry, uh, guns and so on. Here also hell seems from hell. And on the top here always the Buddha so it is possible to be saved uh, after all. This is actually not a picture from illustration from the Sutra about the importance of filial um, piety. Uh, when your parents have died, uh, it is your duty.
using to organize all kinds of uh, services and board centers, which will bring your uh, parents uh, in the end to a good place. And so uh, here the son is carrying his parents uh, to uh, this mountain, which is also a good place. Now, when we look at this Buddhist contrast between heaven and the pure land and the purgatory, and then there's a, and we look at the descriptions in Buddhist Kasa, we see that there's a great emphasis on the vanity of our earthly existence. You cannot take all the riches you have. You may be very rich, wonderful house and nice wives or children but this is not the most time of the death there you have to go alone and it's a very short period of time and uh, the life uh, the, the image is often used it's like a drop of dew on the tip of a spray of grass and there's no one who can evade this, this fate uh, you may be uh, a king very rich um, will happen to you. But um, when you are devout, when you invoke Amitabha uh, with full sincerity at the moment of death, if you do this ten times, you have the time to do this ten times with full concentration, uh, you may be pardoned, uh, even if you are the worst of sinners, a butcher or a murderer. And then something which I already mentioned, and you will reach the pure land, you will never regress, you will be born into a lot lower existence. So it's almost a permanent state. And you probably know that in the 18th century, at the end of the 18th century, suddenly Catholicism is very successful in Korea. Um, in a way that the, the Koreans convert themselves. Uh, uh, the, even before there were any missionaries in Korea, some uh, Koreans uh, decided to adopt Catholicism. How is it possible? And one part of the answer, of course, is that uh, the Jesuits in China had written books in Chinese in which they presented Catholicism in a manner that was palatable uh, to Confucian scholars. So that's certainly part of the answer. But then, we noticed that actually quite early on, there were quite a few women as well who uh, became Catholics. And if you think that in Buddhism, uh, they, uh, if they had any uh, acquaintance with Buddhism that most women have, they would be very familiar with the concept of heaven and hell, and also about the, the idea of the ultimate vanity of already existence, not all there in the Buddhist Kasa, for instance. And then you also have this idea of the divine and superhuman race granting salvation to the truly contrite sinner, even in the moment of death, at a very late moment, after you have had a very sinful life, you can still be forgiven. And then there was also part of the pure land beliefs and Catholicism and similar ideas. So I think the uh, success of Catholicism partly can be uh, uh, explained uh, by pointing out that there were similar ideas in, in Buddhism. Anyway, uh, there is also certainly a weakening dominance of Confucianism. And so I've already argued that the core values of general piety and loyalty are no longer exclusively Confucian. We have seen Buddhists propagating that. Uh, Chanans actually also do the same. And um, you see that there is a religious quest in all kinds of ways of a complements of Confucianism or alternatives to Confucianism, and particularly when it's about the afterlife, what happens after death. So, now, the fact that uh, the Buddhist ideas were so popular in a way it goes right against the, the Confucian brain, so to speak. Uh, because um, uh, Confucians had this idea that really 
uh, you have to do your thing here in this life. And they didn't believe them, some kind of marginal belief in the existence of spirits, but they didn't believe uh, mostly uh, that spirits uh, would exist long after death. So to them, uh, actually, uh, here and now should be important. And the thing uh, that should be left of you is your children, the works you have done, maybe, uh, but not uh, some kind of existence of yourself after them. Um, but um, to many people, it's not an attractive idea, and I think that is one of the things that make Confucianism very vulnerable once the institutional support of the state uh, had been abolished. And so, Confucian virtues were no longer purely Confucian. Uh, their ideas about what happens after death uh, were not all the attractive to many people. So, when Confucianism also, at a certain moment, 1894 is not uh, no more the uh, pathway to a beautiful, great career in which you maybe can become very wealthy as well. Confucianism uh, uh, suddenly is much weakened. And in fact, what we do see in the 21st, in the 20th century, is that institutional Confucianism, where people who are what you might call hardcore Confucians, people who really regard Confucianism as that primary affiliation, they evaporate almost and they will become quite weak. I think at this moment that uh, less than one percent of the whole population is uh, point zero point two or something like that. Very small. If you look at the 20th century, there is this effort evaluation of Confucianism, which I already mentioned. Then I think that actually Protestantism, in a way, also profited from this base laid by uh, the Buddhist groundwork, as I put it here. The Confucian uh, Catholicism that profited from earlier. And then something which is very debatable, actually, I think, but. Uh, there was this concept in Buddhism. Uh, uh, it's not that there's no uh, discrimination of women uh, at all in Buddhism, but uh, the Buddhist caste, for instance, always emphasized that whether you're a man or a woman, old or young, uh, you can reach the pure land. Uh, so in that sense, it was egalitarian, uh, maybe up to a certain point, but that's the best. But that's where you also very ideal, maybe egalitarian. Society. Okay, that's actually basically the story. There is some 